And welcome back to In Session. I'm Jean Casares. We are live in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. Jody Arias says that she stabbed her ex-boyfriend more than two dozen times, slitting his throat, shooting him in the head. She says it was in self-defense. In opening statements, the defense said Arias was a victim of domestic violence, insisting that Travis Alexander sexually abused and manipulated her. To talk about all of this, because we are now in the defense case, we are hearing from the defense now, and, and to really understand it all, we've got one of the leading experts in this country, forensic and clinical psychologist, Dr. Daniela Schreier, who is joining us right now live from Chicago. We have personal injury attorney and former criminal defense attorney, Dan Marco, and in-session contributor, Joey Jackson, in-session contributor and law enforcement analyst, Mike Brooks. We've got everybody. Dr. Daniel Schreier, I really want to ask you this because I was, I've been thinking about the defense a lot. And the one thing that I think is important here, we know the prosecution had an overwhelming case. We know that their case in chief was very strong, one of the strongest I think I've ever seen. But now it's the defense turn. And I think we all need to have a, a clean slate, innocent until proven guilty. Let us see what they have so we can analyze it. The defense will say she was emotionally abused. She was a victim of domestic violence. Well, they say, Dr. Schreier, that she was a victim of sexual abuse. That on the outside it looked consensual, but it really wasn't. Well, hi. Um, so nice to be here. We don't really have enough information to make a final statement. We have never spoken to her, but I am saying no, because sexual abuse is defined as a non-consensual sexual uh, experience. But we have seen we have two consenting adults, and they were not under the influence of alcohol or drugs at any time. I am thinking this is actually an obsessive and addictive relationship, Jean. Relationships and men can be like drugs to some women. She was obsessed with him. She couldn't get what she wanted. She wanted a commitment. He didn't give that. And in my opinion, this is what drove the entire thing. She used sex and for sure she overstepped her moral limits. She wanted to please him and she became increasingly angry. So this is my interpretation. The only way out would be to actually say that, okay, if he was like an alcohol or drugs to her, any addict knows at one point the craving takes over. You are not powerful enough anymore to have power over the drug. If she lost that power over him, then it would mean, as a matter of fact, that she cannot make free decisions anymore. But I do not think it was sexual abuse as per the facts that we have. All right. All right, Dr. Schreier, you're saying that she was obsessed with Travis, she was addicted to Travis, but the defense is saying that it was Travis that forced himself on her, that she became that dirty little secret. How does that play into all of this? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Certainly in America nowadays, people have sex after the third date for men and fifth date for women. And very often there's pressure from one or the other side to proceed. However, we cannot hold someone else responsible for our choices or decisions. Also, it's true, I think she might feel really abused because yes, um, it's, it seems that they broke up after a short time and he used her for sex. He might even have spoken about her badly to his friends. His friends still nowadays t uh, tell the media that he could have done better. So she might have perceived all that. But, you know, sexual deviance is a little different. As a psychologist, I'm thinking about the DSM, our Diagnostic Statistical Manual. And this would be um, in the case of paraphilia. That's what we call sexual disorders. It's beside love. It's uh, um, um, urges that are there all the time, sexual urges that are very much different from normative behavior, okay, uh, uh, involves different situations, etc. And I don't see that he was deviant or actually forced her. Deviant gene, for example, would be pedophilia. That's the most well known when an adult actually sexually violates a child. We know about uh, voyeurism. Someone goes around trying to observe others, non consensual adults, having sex sex, right? That was not happening. So in my opinion, the case might be she feels used 
She, um, she, however, volunteered her sexual activity in order to get a prize, and she did not get that prize. That's my point of view. So she wasn't sexually abused. He's not a sexual deviant. Knowing this case as you do, as a professional, do you see this as premeditated murder? Do you see it as self-defense, or do you see it as a heat of passion manslaughter case? Last week or two weeks ago, we talked about a catathymic homicide. I am thinking she became so obsessed with him. She was thinking about him 24-7. Women, unfortunately, stay in relationships, also unhealthy relationships, longer than they should. She became increasingly frustrated, and it was like a craving, potentially, like even physiologically. She was waiting for his text or for his call. She would probably pace up and down at home. She would start sweating. It's really like a drug. And I'm thinking uh, this, is, this is basically w what she was uh, going through. I, I think to a point it was maybe not premeditated. My thought is she came there. She drove all these miles voluntary to see him. They took pictures, etc. right? And de deviant, just to put that in, what is the standard for sexual norms today in America? Maybe anal sex and also vaginal insertion of object has become fairly normative to the mainstream of America. I don't know. But she might have actually participated voluntarily. At the end, he might have told her, look, I'm going to Mexico tomorrow. She might have pushed, who are you taking? He might have told her, and I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, Mike Brooks, I think Dr. Daniela Schreiber may have hit it on the head. All right, let's bring in our guest right now. First of all, we still have Dr. Daniela Schreier, a forensic and clinical psychologist joining us out of Chicago. Dan Marco, former criminal defense attorney, personal injury lawyer out of the Phoenix jurisdiction, Joey Jackson, in-session contributor in New York, and Mike Brooks, in-session law enforcement analyst and contributor. Um, Dr. Daniela Schreier, I, I want to read for everybody and you some of what was in the defense plea proposal. This is back from 2010. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about this, so here we go. First of all, it says, and this is the defense, wanting to plead guilty. They say, quote, expert testimony will be presented regarding the extremely demeaning, degrading, and abusive behavior Travis exhibited towards Jody and its effect on Jody. Travis's own words will paint a tawdry picture, not of a choir boy steadfastly practicing his faith, but of a playboy expert manipulator and sexual deviant. Dr. Daniela Schreier joining us out of Chicago. Let me tell you one other thing, Dr. Schreier. One of the experts on the defense witness list, their psychologist, guess what he specializes in? Sexual deviancy. So it looks like this is how they're going. Can you define for us again, in just very basic terms, what a sexual deviant is? Well, as I said before, if you look into the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual that we use for diagnosing that, you look into sexual disorders, right? Paraphilias, we have said that before. The most famous one would be pedophilia, right? Anything that goes against the social norm, it doesn't fit with it. But the problem here would be, do we have really any signs that Travis Alexander, other than being a dance away lover who didn't want to commit, was really a sexual deviant. All we see is that she was consenting to what he proposed. Look into America and look at the reference group. Most people in their 20s and 30s have premarital sex nowadays. So that's not anymore amoral or against the moral. Then more and more people now, in former times, anal intercourse or actually any type of um, insertion of foreign objects into the anus or vagina before were um, actually seen as deviant, even per law in many states. But nowadays, it's no longer that way because things have changed. So they would really have to come up with a clear label. They cannot label him for sure as what? a pedophile because she was not underage. So what is he coming up and demonstrating that really that we could see where is he sexually out of the norm? What did he do to her? All right, let me ask you. Let me, let me play devil's advocate. As a member of the Mormon faith, where you aren't even supposed to have premarital relations of any type, 
does that then set a different standard here for sexual deviancy? Well, but you know what? Now, I'm Catholic. I'm saying that many organized religions are against premarital sex. Many of believers do not hold up to that anymore. They are in long-term relationships and they have premarital sex. That would be maybe a moral violation of your faith, but that doesn't have to do with sexual deviance. If you look into it and a little further and say that the Mormon church would be his reference group, he was very active, yes, Probably there was this law of the church that he violated morally, but then it does not mean that in terms of, I'm not a legal expert, but even psychologically, he was a sexual deviant. It has to be proven according to the book, and I have not seen or found that. So it will be interesting what okay. they're pulling out of their hats. and.